everyone. Welcome and welcome on this beautiful, beautiful day to the Soto United Methodist Church's uh, Saturday, excuse me, Sunday service. <laughs> oh, pardon me, I should just start all over again. Welcome. Um, I just hope that you guys here are so appreciative of being able to get together and worship and everyone who's at home worshiping. That is awesome. And watch, watching later on YouTube, I mean, how many options do we have now to worship together? I think that is a blessing that has come out of a bad situation. So let us embrace that. Um, I want to just mention a few little announcements here. Every last Sunday for August, September, and October, we're going to be worshiping outside. So the next one is next week, August 29th. So bring a lawn chair, bring a friend, bring your coffee, and come and join us on the front lawn for outdoor worship. Also, there's going to be a children, youth, and family ministry team meeting on August 24th, 6.30 p.m. New team members are always welcome, and they're going to plan activities for the ministry. Um, and if you have any questions, contact Sabrina. Her uh, email address is in the bulletin. There's a United Methodist Women's Meeting on Monday, August 23rd at 7 p.m. to discuss events for the remainder of the year uh, and filling out the church calendar. Um, the meeting is on Zoom, but my understanding is also here, too, at the church, so you, again, have choices. And Linda Patton, her information is in the bulletin if you want her to send you a link for the Zoom meeting, an invitation. And Pastor Jeff, I'm sure you have announcements. Thank you, Shelley. Well, good morning, friends. Grace and peace to you in the name of the risen Christ. It is a blessing to be here in this space with all of you and to also welcome anyone who is joining us from home. Know that you are in sacred space as well as we experience worship together on this beautiful Sunday morning. My name is Reverend Jeff Crowfro, and I serve as pastor here at the Soto United Methodist Church. And I want to extend a warm welcome to any visiting guests who are joining us for this service. We are finalizing our um, sermon series. This is the final sermon in our three R's for getting back to school. And we're going to look at radical love. And we're going to look at a scripture passage in which Christ calls us to love our enemies. And we will explore kind of the implications for our faith as we go out ready to love our enemies, love those who perhaps would do us harm, as we actively engage in Christ's love for all the world together. And again, it is a blessing, as Shelly mentioned, to be in this space with all of you and to worship in many variety of ways and in different places. And so I hope wherever you are from this morning, know that you are seen and know that you are blessed. Friends, you're invited to stand as you're able as we continue this time of worship together with our call to worship as led by Shelley. Clothed in faith and showered in love, we gather shining with God's light. Washed in joy and bathed in hope, we worship radiant with Christ's love. Blessed with gifts far more precious than jewels, we, we celebrate, blazing with the fire of God's Spirit. The opening hymn is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, number 384. Please remain standing. Join me.
I love the fourth verse. It begins with, finish then thy new creation. And we are participants in the new creation together as made known to us through the love of Christ. And Christ enters into our hearts and we go out into the world ready to proclaim the good news as a community of faith. And one of the hallmarks of this community, again, is our willingness to pray for, with, and on behalf of one another. And I know this morning we have much to pray for, we have much to celebrate, and we have many concerns in our hearts. And when we open ourselves up and let it go, so to speak, and give it over to God, I know we are strengthened as a community together blessed by the strength of Christ's love. And so we are invited, everybody at home and everyone here in this space, to open yourselves up to the movement of the Spirit in your hearts and open ourselves up to letting go of all that is in our hearts, minds, and souls together as we prepare for this time of prayer. And I know this morning we want to lift up in prayer Gil Runzi as he continues to recover from surgery. I know that uh, Gene Chavez will be here momentarily, and he has a card where he's going to invite the congregation to sign for uh, Gil. As if on cue, he's right there. Uh, folks at home can't see this, but um, there he is. So continue prayers for Gil and Linda during this time of healing. And this morning, um, Marsha Miller showed us a picture of granddaughter Margo, and who officially became a U.S. citizen. Um, had her little American flag. It, it, it's a little too complicated to go into the full details, but Margot is in France with, um, and so there's all these steps that you have to take, but we're just blessed to be able to announce that and to see a wonderful, so after service, corner Marsha, she'll show you a beautiful picture. So that is a blessing. I know last week I mentioned that we have a family friend who is serving in the State Department in um, Kabul, Afghanistan. And he recently posted that, you know, they're just working really hard right now. And they are in a situation where they're just getting lots of people out, where they're doing the necessary work to ensure the safety of as many people as possible. I recognize it's a complicated situation, but we just want to continue to be in prayer for all those who are serving in Afghanistan and for those who are seeking refuge during this most difficult of seasons. Well, friends, we are a community that is ready to pray with, for, and on behalf of one another. Christ even called us to pray for those with whom perhaps we would name as our enemy. And so you're invited to give over to God all that is in your hearts, recognizing that each and every one of us has been given the divine spark, breathe the divine breath so that we may be in relationship with God and one another, recognizing that though we may experience brokenness within those relationships, God can heal and Christ can reconcile in the power of the Holy Spirit can help us gather together in prayer. So let us continue this time of prayer together with the prayer of the people led by Shelley. <clears throat> Mighty God, who out your power and strength on us, grant us the nourishment we need to receive your word. May your presence fill our lives and carry us forth preparing us to be your people and equipping us to do your work in the world in Christ's love. In your holy name we pray. Amen. together in worship, both here and in all of our sacred spaces, ready to live into your promise of radical love. 
And that means recognizing that not only are we to love our neighbors, we are to love our enemies. We are to share in this life of faith together, demonstrating that we are a compassionate people, ready to live into the life that Christ calls us to live. Help us to be strengthened for this journey this morning as we experience both the joys and concerns of the world, as we think about those who need to experience the fullness of healing grace, for those who are huddled, scared, wondering what the next day will bring, to others who celebrate uh, new transitions in the newness of life. All of this, we know that you receive. You receive all that we have to give, and your spirit is poured out on us and all the many gathered around the world this morning. And we pray all of this in the name of the risen Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And as we respond to our prayers today, you're invited to turn to number 378, and we will sing the first and last verses of Amazing Grace. of Children, Youth, and Family, Sabrina Wellman, as she offers this special children's moment as we get ready to listen to the scripture for this morning. Good morning, friends. It's good to be worshiping with you this morning. Today, we are talking about love. And what do you think about when you hear that word? And you think about the love that your parents have for each other, or maybe they have for you and you have for them. Or maybe you think about something that you love, like maybe you have a favorite food that you love to eat, or you have a favorite pet that you love to take care of, or a favorite activity that you just love to do. Well, in our scripture today, Jesus is teaching about love. And Jesus' teachings were different from what people were used to hearing. And so the people were curious when they came to hear Jesus teach. They were curious to hear what he would say. So I invite you this morning to be curious about what Jesus is going to tell us about love as we listen to our scripture from this video this morning. Today's scripture is from the book of Luke, chapter 6, verses 27 through 35. But I say to you who are willing to hear, love your enemies. 
Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, offer the other one as well. If someone takes your coat, don't withhold your shirt either. Give to everyone who asks, and don't demand your things back from those who, you, who take them. Treat people in the same way that you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, why should you be commended? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, why should you be commended? Even sinners do that. If you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, why should you be commended? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be paid back in full. Instead, love your enemies, do good, and lend expecting nothing in return. If you do, you will have a great reward. You will be acting the way the children of the Most High act, for he is kind to ungrateful and wicked people. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Jesus' teachings are different, aren't they? Love your enemies. Be kind to those who hurt you. Don't just be nice to your friends, but be good to those people who are mean to you. And pray for your enemies. Pray for people who are mean to you. Jesus' teachings are showing us how God would have us live, how we can behave, right? How to behave as a person of God. But the things that he and the things that he said that changed the way these people who came to him it changed the way they thought about treating others. Did it change the way you thought you should treat other people when you heard those words? Are those the things that we that we see other people doing? Friends, do you follow what Jesus said to do? It's really hard, isn't it? It's hard to love our enemies. It's hard to be kind to people who are not kind to us. But this is what we're called to do to live as a child of God, as a person of God. And so I invite you to, to pray about it. I'm going to be praying about it because it's not easy. And to keep working on it as you grow. And to talk to mom and dad and your grandma and grandpa. Talk to them about it too. And ask them how easy or hard it is. What they do to help them um, help themselves when they're trying to love an enemy. And Pray for people who are not always nice to us. And we can learn together as we journey on our faith path. And I will share with Pastor Jeff a book reading that you can read that goes along with our scripture today. I brought a picture of the book because my library was out of it. It's called Enemy Pie. And even though the way that things go in this story might not be as easy for us, it has some great ideas on how to turn an enemy into a friend. And so, as Jesus taught us to pray, we are going to pray right now. We will pray an echo prayer. So I will say a line, and I invite you to repeat it after me. Let's pray. Loving God. Teach me to be loving, especially to the people who are the hardest to love. Amen.
friends, I invite us to continue to be in an attitude of reflection during this time of worship. As Shelley Coker plays for us, my shepherd will supply my need. those at home who are patiently enjoying worship this morning. We are experiencing, I can tell, some slight internet lag issues here at the church, but it seems to be correcting itself. So if I'm doing this, eventually I'll be doing this again. So thank you for, for your patience on that. Friends, will you pray with me and for me? Holy God, may the word of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be a faithful response to the Spirit moving among us in this place, in this moment. Amen. Well, friends, we're kind of in that season where um, college football is thrust upon us, and it is a time of just some unique rivalries. Even though the college landscape seems to be shifting to where there may never be a rivalry again, except for a few. I have a friend, who uh, Josh, who grew up in Michigan, and he was a University of Michigan fan. And, you know, it didn't matter how many national championships the, the Wolverines could win. It didn't matter how many wins or losses you had during the year. Everything boiled down to whether or not Michigan could beat Ohio State. And, you know, <laughs> I've known Josh for uh, over 20 years now, and I could always know when that game was on because he totally shut down contact, and I always knew whether or not they won because Josh was either in a fantastic mood or he'd be in a bad mood. I gotta tell you, he's been in a bad mood quite a bit on that particular Saturday. And it was, you know, a rivalry, which, you know, I thought we here in the state of Kansas had some pretty deep rivalries. Uh, in basketball, it used to be KU-MU. In football, you know, 
K-State and KU with some trying stuff, so particularly when they're both bad, and we're trying to claim the honor of being the worst college football team out there. But nothing quite prepared me for this most heated and hated of uh, dispositions between Michigan and Ohio State people. And, you know, it kind of got me to thinking how we allow ourselves to kind of live into that and have such passion around such things as college rivalries. You know, the same is true of any other sport, I would say, whether professional or, um, you know, basketball, baseball, and the like. But nothing quite beats that um, intensity that that type of rivalry brings, particularly uh, Michigan and Ohio State and things like that. And so I find that I, at times, will kind of get heated when it comes to my own particular rivalries, a lot of times around sports. And I have to recognize that just because you're a Yankees fan, that I can, in fact, break bread with you. Um, oh, there are some people shaking their heads no. Um, <laughs> which I understand and pray for, for that as well. Or when it comes to the college basketball fan, you know, again, if KU ever plays Missouri again, um, I will still extend an open hand to those who are from Missouri and who perhaps would celebrate the, the Tigers. I won't name names, but we do have people in our own household for which that is true as well. And, but it's kind of silly, but it's real easy to get that, to that passionate response. It's really easy for us to um, kind of lean in maybe a little too hard into this idea of that hated rivalry, that heated rivalry. You know, it's like we almost have a disposition to when recognizing our enemy, so to speak, we're ready to not recognize any humanity within them, but to do our best to ensure their ultimate destruction. Um, by proxy, with football, we hope we score more points than, than the other team does. But in life, sometimes it's hard to kind of let go of that disposition as we move forward on this journey together. And so when Jesus says something like, you know what? You need to love your enemies. Whew. We have to take that deep breath and that deep sigh. And again, we have this moment because Jesus has a way of knowing how to say very disruptive things that cut against the grain of who we are and how we behave. A quick read of this passage, though, you know, kind of suggests a sort of submission to the powers that be. You know, it's like, okay, Ohio State, you can go ahead and beat Michigan however many times you want. But that would be a mistake that leads to a certain dismissiveness of these words. These are deep and difficult words. The reality of what Jesus is saying demonstrates a harder, more fulfilling path that refuses to deny grace even to our most bitter of enemies, while also calling us to a deeper discipleship that sees authentic resistance as more consistent with who God is calling us to be. You know, it's a way for us to live into God's calling in our hearts together. By loving our enemies, by turning the other cheek, by going the extra mile, Jesus is telling us never to let go of our own capacity for compassion and love and give in to the wellspring of hate that can so easily turn into fear and cause greater destruction. You know, sometimes for some of us, it is easy to go to that place of hate and fear-mongering and anger fun unfettered. Again, there's nothing wrong with being angry. There's nothing wrong with demonstrating uh, compassion towards the world. But when we allow that compassion and anger and hatred to turn into fear and the dehumanizing of someone else, then we begin to lose our own sense of self. This type of resistance to our own worst selves is not giving up or giving in, but rather is a steadfast resolve 
that still allows for love to reign. That doesn't mean we must sometimes break free from those who wish us harm. It's not about, you know, just staying in um, cycles of abuse, because we are called to break free from that. What this is calling us to do is the call and need for justice is still at the forefront of how we live in community. But to love our enemy is to still see to it that we do not strip away the humanity of others to placate our own selfish needs. Now, to first century hearers of this passage, they would have been astonished by this. One of the things that would happen, for instance, um, in this setting, the Romans were the Roman occupiers, and if a soldier came up to you, that soldier had the right to force you to carry his pack for a mile. After the mile, you had to give it back to the soldier, and then he would go on. What Jesus is saying is, you know, when that happens, go ahead and say, you know what, I will go that extra mile for you, even though what you're doing is stripping away my own rights and self-worth. But I am still going to demonstrate to you your own worthiness within God's kingdom, despite that. And so as you think about these cultural things, we begin, begin to understand the deeper impact, as well as the deeper difficulty. Who wants to carry that path for that extra mile? And so deeply within most of our hearts, is that very desire to strike back against those who hurt us. We sometimes harbor such enmity towards them, often applauded by this wider culture. You know, we hear so often, you know, if you hate someone, really hate someone and let them know it. That truly, it really takes no less than God's divine love to soften our own hearts. A love that is given for all, not just a few, and give it to those that we hate as well, you know? And for those who hate us, that is how God's love is poured out. But we know the great difficulty in being able to share in that love. I firmly believe that God wants us to pray for our enemies. Praying for those who are actively working against us doesn't preclude self-defense, nor does it temper God's call. For justice, it is still a worthy thing to try. We may never have that full reconciliation or gain the full trust of our enemy in this lifetime, but to pray for them is to be ones who recognize that we are not in control of hope or grace, but rather God is. And that not only is it a call for perhaps transformation on our enemy's part, but our own transformation as well. Because this radical love, strengthened by the pillars of radical hospitality and radical empathy, is not exclusive in a condition upon one person over another. This radical love isn't saying, you know, this is just for this person over here. The rest of you can just stay in the back of the line. Christ demonstrated that despite all of us being sinners, and it's okay to admit that we're all sinners. You know, some of us are Ohio State fans. Or K-State fans. Oh my gosh. Or KU fans. Out of his love for everybody, out of Christ's love for everybody, he really was willing to go to the cross. That despite our proclivity to create division and discord, to not only seek reconciliation, to do our best to strip away the humanity of others so that we can feel strengthened within ourselves, Christ was ready to say, no, 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 this is for all. My actions are for one person, they're for everybody. And the path that led there included an openness to meeting others where they were, even those who ultimately would bring about his death. But Christ still ate with them and was ready to talk with them and was ready to heal. And it was concluded on this sense of divine love being known in the midst of community. And I think we've sometimes lost sight of that deeper significance of Christ's radical love. 
We need to reclaim that inclusiveness and all-encompassing nature of who Christ is and continues to be. We as individuals, as we deal with other individuals near and far, need to recapture that notion, that radicality, you know, that rootedness. Talking about radical and being the root of something. We need to reclaim the root of God's love for one another. And that even those to whom we may have strong disagreement still requires us to love them. Martin Luther King Jr. once said that there is a little tree planted on a little hill, and on that tree hangs the most influential character that ever came into this world. But never feel that that tree is a meaningless drama that took place on the stages of history. No, King says, it is a telescope through which we look out into the long vista of eternity and see that the love of God breaking forth into time. With Christ, God's love is breaking forth in time. And that love continues to break forth as we go about our daily lives together, sharing in the radical love of Christ. Rooted in love. Rooted in compassion. Rooted in, again, that radical hospitality and radical empathy together. It is an eternal reminder to a power-drunk generation that love is the only way. It is an eternal reminder to a generation depending on misinformation to drive division, a generation depending on physical violence, that love is the only creative, redemptive, transforming power in the universe. That is who Christ is in our lives. That is what Christ is saying in Luke right here. And if we can allow ourselves to be transformed because of our ability to love our enemies, then that transformation truly can be made known and unveiled as we go about our faith lives together. As we look into all of our eyes, into all the eyes of our brothers and sisters here in this community, in this country, in this world, we say to one another, I love you. I would rather die than hate you. Sometimes it's easy to give in to that hatred. But if we can step back and say, you know what? Boy, that takes way too much energy on my part. I don't want that hatred to live in my head rent free. I want to use that creative space to love. And if that love brings us to the point of death together, then so be it. And it's okay to say that we're foolish enough to believe that through the power of this love somewhere, that people, even of the most disruptive and discordant nature, can respond in kind. That they too can be transformed. And that we are all participants in God's kingdom together we will be able to live into this calling of Christ that says, let's go ahead and go the extra mile for one another. Let's turn the other cheek to demonstrate that power isn't so much through force, but power is given through our ability to love one another. So God, we call to help us in our lives and in all of our attitudes, to help us be that um, controlled by your force of love for one another. Now we don't have to, you know, choose politics as that battleground. Now we don't have to live into discordant voices that tell us that these people are right, these people are wrong, and this is the only way we can get along. But whether we are truly called to live into and love one another, to not only loving those immediately close to us, but the saying that when we look into the eyes of our enemy, what we don't see is an object to hate or destroy, but rather a person given the divine breath that we are called to love together. And that is the radical love of Christ. Amen.
Let us pray. Holy God, we are blessed by the movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our hearts. We are blessed by your radical love being poured out on us, challenging us to live into the calling of Christ together. And we pray all of this in your Son's name. Well, friends, as we prepare for this time of offering, um, yesterday we had a number of people come to the church and do a deep clean. And it was a, a good gathering of folks, and I want to offer a word of thanks to all those who were able to make it yesterday. And thank you for um, helping with getting the church straightened up again, so to speak, which is necessary. I do want to add that um, we did have some water damage in our pre-K classroom down in the lower level after that really heavy rain we had oh, a week and a half ago or so. And so we're having to replace the flooring with some new uh, tiling. If you wish to uh, donate to that, you are free to do so. Simply just write uh, pre-K classroom if on the memo line or let the office know. We'll also be receiving uh, a generous gift from the Bowman Memorial Fund to help cover that cost. But more importantly, it's a recognition as we gathered together yesterday to work together that it was simply through our presence together, our willingness to help one another, that we were doing the mission and ministry of the church. And I know many of us in our own separate places, in our own separate spaces, are doing a lot for the betterment of the community and the world. And in that, you are demonstrating what it means to be part of Christ's offering to the world. Not only through the giving of resources, which we are invited to do at this time, but the giving of your time through your prayer and your presence, through your giftedness, through your witness. And that is what builds the foundation for any strong church to truly be impactful in the community. And for that, this community truly is a blessing. Charles will come forward at this time so that we may receive the offering. For those who wish to give at home, you are welcome to go to our website, desotoumc.org, and click the Giving tab, or simply mail a check to the church. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> gives to you. May they continue to serve the mission ministry of the Holy Church for the transformation of the world. In your son's name. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, thank you for joining us today on this beautiful summer's morning. Thank you all for joining us from home. It is a blessing again to participate in worship with everyone gathered and scattered. And this morning for our closing hymn, we will sing number 408, The Gift of Love.
friends, may we go from this place refreshed and renewed in the spirit, ready to share in God's radical love for one another, ready to share in each other's joys and burdens together so that we can move forward in our faith lives, demonstrating the fullness of Christ's gift to all of us. Go down in peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you.